OK, so here for this one, we have the Athletics, Matt Slater and our Chelsea writer, Simon Johnson, who was actually at Stamford Bridge last night where Chelsea won 3-2 against Newcastle. Simon, I mean, Chelsea still looked a bit shaky, but you know what? They got the job done, didn't they? Yeah, and I, I think it was one of those where that was what it was all about, really, especially for Richo Pochettino, um, given the charming uh, reception he was given during the Brentford game the, the previous week. Um, for him to, he actually got a bit of applause from a few fans when he walked down the tunnel. I, I think they were being quite kind to him. Um, it wasn't convincing. Uh, it was it was Chelsea in a nutshell. They had their moments where they looked good, but they also had periods where they just couldn't handle um, being in front, being able to sort of cope with Newcastle's press. I think the Newcastle's equaliser sums up what Chelsea can, the, the worst Chelsea can be. But importantly, it just keeps that little bit of hope alive that, that they can do something in the league uh, in terms of a high finish, perhaps a European qualification. Mm. And it just keeps their belief going ahead of an FA Cup quarterfinal. Yeah, I mean, I was also thinking as uh, Chelsea playing Newcastle, two teams under new ownership, under new regimes or new ideas of how to bring players in or, or whatnot. Um, anything you could take from where either club are at this moment in time in terms of their ownership? <laughs> Work in progress, I yeah. think is the brightest <laughs> way of putting it. I mean, look, Newcastle, Newcastle are clearly, they got off to a brilliant start in terms of how things were going. And now they've hit a bit of a, a, a perhaps inevitable bit of a blip, a little bit of a plateau, um, injuries obviously Chelsea can certainly relate to that affecting them um, so th they seem to have stagnated at least for this season um, Chelsea just feels a bit more the same um, this this project this process by young players it was always in the hope of them coming good in the future as, as a collective um, but they kind of forgot the here and now and that kind of is what matters in football that, that supporters want results instantly. They they don't want to hear that Chelsea might be good in five years' time. They they want Chelsea to be the Chelsea under Abramovich, as which is why they keep singing his name. A section of them that that would win a trophy pretty much every season. Matt Simon just talked about the Abramovich era. I mean, Chelsea did have some some success, but things weren't all tickety boo though, were they? Some success. Oh, I mean, Simon, help me out here. How, how many trophies did Chelsea win? Weren't they the most successful? No, team 19, in yeah. 19 in, in as many years, essentially. And and I think they're just hanging on by a... Yeah, by a well, now. City are obviously, yeah. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. but, they, but, they, but they were a winning machine, weren't they? I mean, that's that's mm. the thing. And they and, it, and, and look, I, I was I, I went to the Carabao Cup final and I was I was leafing through the programme, as I do sometimes. And and what struck me, and it, and I'd sort of forgotten this, you know, I, I'm 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 a, I'm over fifty now, and, but when I was a kid, I'm sorry to say this, Chelsea fans, you you weren't a big club, you're not not really, you were, you were one of them, but you weren't one one of the biggies, you weren't serial winners, and I and I was leafing through your honours list, and it, it is night and day. There there is there is. You, <laughs> Was there a, was it a title in the fifties? Is there, there was an FA Cup in there somewhere? League Cup, Cup, yeah, Winners Cup, yeah. And, and then you get to the nineties, and suddenly you know Matthew Hardy money starts to get better, and then boom, two thousands trophies, trophies every year. You know, so back in the you know you were no bigger than Portsmouth, you were smaller than Forest, you were well not smaller, you were le less successful than than loads of other clubs. So I can understand why Chelsea fans. Uh, you know, look back fondly on the Roman Abramovich here. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I fully understand that. Mm. I suppose what you're saying, Ayo, is, 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 is how did the rest of football feel about it? Um, <laughs> the rest of football didn't feel that great, probably for the reasons that I've sort of outlined, mm. you know, that, that Chelsea were that kind of lottery club. You know, they, they, they absolutely, they were the, they were the, the you know, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory club. They, they, they won, they won, boom. And then it, every, their lives changed. And, um, you know, a lot of the issues we talk about now, you know, we worry about sort of the domination of Man City and, and potentially, you know, Newcastle, you know, nation state stuff. Ab Abramovich was that guy. You know, it, financial fair play, what UEFA did, a lot of that was reaction to, to, to Chelsea coming along, up, upsetting the, the apple cart and, and worrying big entrenched interests. This, they, were the, they were a disruptor club. So 
um, I think the story of the Bramovich era, though, is how quickly they became part of the furniture part. They became an establishment club in, in the, you know, even I who remember the eighties and nineties had almost forgotten how much they had changed. They really, you know, they, they, they are one of the sort of premier league success stories. They, they, mm. they, they went from a club that their support almost exclusively from West London and and, and that part of town going, going, going back along the, the motorway there. And, you know, th that's where their fan base came from. And West London, you know, has other clubs as well. It was, you know, it's a congested market, competitive market to a club that genuinely has fans everywhere. And we know that at the Athletic, we can see who reads the mm. stories. You know, they are genuinely now, you know, one of our biggest clubs, you know, absolute, you know, they're there always in the Deloitte money list. And, and we expect, you know, they are big six, aren't they? They are, they have big, you know, corporate international sponsors from around the world. So, so, you know, their, their story changed and, and, and it is a bit remarkable to me, you know, how, how quickly it changed and how, and what that might say about Manchester City. I mean, they, they're obviously there as well. And what it might say about Newcastle and how you can do it, you know, in a, in a generation or two. So, look, it didn't end well. You know, we know that because otherwise, the, the, you know, Todd Bowley and Clear Lake wouldn't, wouldn't be there. But those questions about Abramovich, about the source of his money, about his friendships, about Putin, about they were there and we just ignored them. We did. We did. And it's not... Mm. It's not only football's fault. You know, UK PLC ignored them. London, the city ignored them. You know, that, that, that those issues, those question marks about should we be cozying up to Russian oligarchs, that we, we all bear responsibility there. I mean, maybe not personally, but sort of as a as a nation, we made we made that mistake. So, look, I guess that's the, the you know, how, what, you're, what you're getting at with your question. But I just I just from a purely football point of view, the Abramovich era was a was, was a smash hit. Mm. And and it's remarkable how much the club changed. Yeah, for sure. And the club is changing, Simon. You know, using uh, Matt's words, you know, Abramovich upsetting the apple cart, disruptors of a club. Uh, I think we see that again under a different ownership. Um, how do the fans feel about this one in particular? Oh, they're delighted uh, with how things are going. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I would say, um, and kind of touching on your question before about mm. not everything going perfect under Bramwich, and it kind of gives the new owners a little bit, I think, of a caveat of, of, of why things have not been so great, is that really Abramovich, as harsh as this sounds, Chelsea should have been more what Manchester City are. Like mm. Manchester City were a, brilliant, are a brilliantly run club to sustain their dominance. Chelsea kind of just almost made it up as they went along. It was chaotic, wrong, wasn't it? Yeah. Sat the, the managers manager, in particular. Sat yeah. the manager, get someone else and win a trophy. And it kind of lulled them into a bit of a false sense of security, in my opinion. Um, but the Abramovich era ended with his longest drought without a title. Um, so the new owners come in and you've got this... Abramovich would buy finished articles, big wages agents' fees, etc. So in theory, what the new owners have done is is actually, in theory, it's, it's a good idea. You sort of think, okay, buy young, buy cheap, lower the wage bill, long contracts, do that loophole, although it's now been uh, sort of closed a little bit, mm -hmm. but sort of amortise over a longer period of time. It all kind of makes a bit of sense what they're trying to do. So therefore, you don't have to negotiate with agents every few years. Here's another pay rise. The agent's taking more money out of the club, mm -hmm. etc. The problem is, is when you make this many changes too soon. So basically, rip up for an entire club. Don't build, don't do it in building blocks. Just basically, just it's a whole new club. It's it's not mm -hmm. Chelsea Football Club anymore. It, it's the Todd Blowy Clear Lake Consortium FC. Um, and so you've got a group of players all learning on the job together at the same time. And that's why you often see, as good as some of them are, you know, some of these, we, we can't just sort of make out their kids, like some of the kids mm. in the Carabao Cup final an extra time. You know, we're talking about some big money signings here, but they're all at the same stages of their career. And when you get that, you get inconsistency and you get inconsist inconsistency during matches themselves. So getting back to your question about the fans, what do they make of it? Of course, they're not happy. Mm. They're not happy about Chelsea being mid-table for the second season in a row. It's quite embarrassing. 
You know, they they at the I think there was an element of okay, roll with the punches and and perhaps take a bit of a accept a bit of a downturn. But you're talking about yes, but qualify for the Champions League at least. Mm. Um, but they they don't even look like anywhere near doing that for well, who knows next season even. That that's how big a gap there is that's suddenly grown out of nowhere. So yes, this is a new disruption, and they've certainly caused. Uh, eyebrows to be raised with the way they've been doing things, the amount of money they've spent, these long contracts, and it's got the world of football talking. Mm -hmm. But in summary, people are looking at them as a bit of a, this is how not to run a football club. Whereas Abramovich, I think, got people talking about, oh, wow, you know, he's got money, but he's spending it well and and he's getting success for it. Just trying to offer a little bit of balance here, Matt, in terms of we, we are judging Chelsea at a very early point in their takeover. Who knows what this might look like, you know, four or five years down the line. Um, I think of Arsenal and the Cronkies. I mean, not long ago when things weren't so great, uh, the Arsenal fans were Cronky out, Cronky out. I mean, look at it now. Genius, great appointments, amazing scouting, you know, that the, the list goes on, you know. I mean, this is just the, the landscape we're living in, in, in terms of business as well. And um, maybe fans should just get used to it. Are you suggesting football fans are fickle? <laughs> are emotional? Controversial. Are, are childish? Dare, dare I say, oh, look, I know what you're talking about. Don't you're talking and, about. And, you, and you left Arteta <laughs> out as well. Don't forget. Yeah. Exactly, Don't forget exactly, exactly. Well. exactly. Uh, it's, isn't it remarkable what a few wins can do, eh? Um, yeah. Look, every every fan, every club can... can um, can sympathise, can understand that, I think. Look, I, I, I just think Simon's sort of nailed it, really. I mean, you're right, they, they, they're new, they're, you know, they're not brand new anymore, uh, but they're still new-ish. Uh, I think the thing that sort of slightly surprised me is they very se seem to quickly change their model. So if they, that first window, they, they did go out and carry on buying sort of finished articles and big names, and then they seem, sort of seem to ditch that in the next window and go youth, 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 which, like, at least makes sense as a sort of coherent strategy and, and we shall see and, and therefore you do almost ask your fan base to be patient but they didn't do that they they appear to have applied two models already and ditched the first one then of course they've cycled through managers and that does happen but you know again that doesn't look like they've made particularly great calls and there you know there hasn't been much improvement you know you can sort of see that in the points and the okay look People can pick out certain games and we're talking about off the back of a decent win. And But I think people were kind of hoping to see, you know, a, a, you know, a more linear uh, improvement, which, is, you know, for sport doesn't always work out like that. So maybe we should just part all that and see how they're getting on next year and maybe the year after. But look, that, that's that's where Chelsea are. To, to go to your, your Arsenal point, yeah, I think you're right. I think Arsenal um, are a really interesting club. Every club's, you know, you know unique in their, and, 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 and the like, you know, but this is the thing. So Arsenal, you know, were very much an establishment club. And have been sort of forever. They were the sort of you know the big money club in London, and they've had they've won things throughout their history. Mm -hmm. They had a really really great period in the nineties and noughties. They continued, you know, they, they, whilst they sort of struggled to sort of do it in the league, they kept winning cups. Mm -hmm. And now here we are in the sort of next iteration of, of Arsenal. And of course, there was that whole painful thing with Wenger. You know, how did did, did they stay too long there? They've moved stadium. They, lots has gone on in Arsenal's recent history that you can sort of go, well, that explains that. And if you if they did that, then I certainly understand why they did that. And yeah, okay, that's a consequence of. So I can sort of see the Arsenal story, and it makes sense to me. Cronkies are interesting. They they didn't get much love for a very long time. One, he's 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 not a particularly lovable character. Is he? he doesn't say much. I'm not, I'm not being mean to the guy. He just doesn't. He does, he's, he's just not a warm, cuddly guy. He, he doesn't. He doesn't sort of seem to care about that. He, he's not any warmer or more cuddly at his US sports franchises. But I think the thing that I always used to think about Arsenal, particularly when people were really on him, is that this guy is actually committed to winning. I mean, it, you can't say that his US sports franchises, he's he's just happy to bank the checks and he's just doing this to show off or something, or it's all a big tax write-off. No, he doesn't want to win. It might be a tax write-off as well, by the way, but anyway. But he does want to win, uh, and it, as he has proven in the US, and I think he is proving now. No one can doubt that Arsenal aren't looking like a club mm that wants to win the Premier League and do well in Europe. You know, they've got the stadium. That wasn't him, but he helped sort of finish it. They're still doing stuff there. They've got they've got a good academy. You know, they've got good sponsors. They've got a good setup. Um, you know, and they're buying players. And they've got a manager and they're, 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 you know, pursuing what looks like a coherent strategy on and off the pitch. Yeah. Now, 
to go back to your point, are Arsenal fans enjoying this particular moment in the in the in the Cronky ownership story? Yeah, I think they are, and they'll they'll absolutely you know they'll 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 bloody love him if if he wins the title, right? Or maybe I don't. Do you, do you, I mean, are you ever going to love Silent Stan? I don't know. They'll they'll be they'll admire him. They'll be grateful. Mm-hmm. That's fair. Right. I want to move on to um, multi club ownership. Um, huge moment for Chelsea last June. The company that Todd Bowley Clear Lake Capital Consortium created went by in Chelsea for two point three billion pounds in twenty twenty two. Made Strasbourg the first member of their multi-club model, purchasing 99% of the league on side for 76.3 million euros. That's around $83.1 million. Simon, I know you've written about this. And before we come to you, very quickly, Matt, could you just give us your view on what a multi-club ownership actually is? Could you define it? Yeah, sure. No problem at all. So uh, a multi-club ownership group, the, the, the model is where the same person or entity has controlling stakes in more than one club, all right? There's your multi, more than one. Mm-hmm. And it is very much, in terms of sort of the ideas that are floating around in the football industry, it is the idea of the moment. Um, it is an idea that we are just seeing grow and grow and grow in terms of the number of clubs that are part of multi-club groups. Uh, it is particularly, I think, associated with this wave of North American money that's come mm-hmm. into the game. Uh, English football, very much Part is central to this. You know, a lot of English clubs are part of multi club groups. The English clubs tend to be at the top of the pile because that's where the money is. That's where the eyeballs are. So yeah, it's um, it's it's this dominant idea at the moment. It's kind of new. Well, people have been people. It's not new. New people were doing it in the nineties. Uh, people have uh, certain people have done it sort of continually ever since. But it has just exploded in the last mm. few years. Simon, you know, Chelsea purchasing Racing Club, Racing Club de Strasbourg, Alsace, I think it's fully called. Um, Was this a surprise package? Uh, Why League R? In terms of that, there was never a sort of, oh, Strasbourg from day one, that's the club Mm. they want. They they were looking and still are looking. Strasbourg is just part one, that they will be looking at other clubs uh, in Portugal, for example. Mm. But... Um, Strasbourg they looked at as some as a club that was being very well run um, financially they actually looked at some of the sort of commercial deals even at a much lower mm. level than Chelsea of course and sort of went oh that, that's actually a bit of an example to follow but they're a club that were that they felt potential just seems to be a key word with this lot they felt they had a lot of potential and and saw they could get a good price for it now why do they want to do multi-club well, Todd Bowley gave an interview at a conference, I can't remember which one, quite early on, where he talks about, for example, the, the loan system and how uh, Chelsea under Abramovich had the loan system, um, used it a lot. But the problem was, as Todd Bowley explained, and I think, he, again, he made a fair point, he said once once a player leaves on loan, you have very little say in what happens to that player. And he said, "This is crazy. Like this is this is your asset, and you don't really have any say in how much he plays." Now, one of the ways around it, have a multi-club model, and you can say, "Here's our player, play him. <laughs> you can have him, but play him." Mm. Um, but also, it's an avenue to perhaps sign young talent, get them to play regularly, and then perhaps they go on to play for Chelsea, or you can make some money by selling them elsewhere and the whole model Mm -hmm. therefore benefits. Now, is it working well at Strasbourg at the moment? Well, (laughs) I think we can just take one look at the league on the table. They're Mm. one point above the relegation zone. The fans are restless. Um, The average age of the team, just like Chelsea's very young, um, has dropped significantly against Paris Saint-Germain a few weeks ago. It's 228 which actually matched an average age that the Chelsea team had recently of 22.8. The symmetry of mm. the two clubs is quite remarkable. Um, but Chelsea, again, will see this as a long-term project that they, they're confident will, will come good. If the idea of uh, this model is to obviously be able to exchange assets from time to time. I know Chelsea have got a couple of players at Strasbourg at this moment in time. Um, how are they doing? 
Uh, well, Angelo Gabriel was actually having a good loan. Unfortunately, he's picked up an injury, which is going to keep him out for six to eight weeks. Um, not very good timing. So he's been working well. But what I should say as well is that he was a player that um, Strasbourg were already looking at. But of course, they did not have the finances or the gravitas to compete mm. for his signature. So for for Strasbourg, this seemed like, well, this is this is amazing. You know, suddenly they could get a player that they didn't re- that they wanted, but they couldn't afford. And and Bluco say, don't worry, we like him too. We'll sign him, and and you can have him on loan. It's win win. Um, and who knows, maybe he stays on loan again next season um so he's played quite a lot i mean yes there there have been some problems and and Vieira has shown that he's not just going to to bow down to what blue co would obviously prefer there are, there are periods where he's been out the side mm-hmm. um as for andre santos this looks like it's not going to be a great loan again for him I, i've got a lot of sympathy for santos victim of a very bad loan to nottingham mm-hmm. forest um, he only played a couple of games, didn't he, or something? I can't even remember. How yeah, because Nottingham, Nottingham Forest agreed a loan deal for him and mm-hmm. then they went out and signed a couple of midfielders. Mm-hmm. Genius. So, <laughs> and, and what are you going to do? You, you, you're going to pick the guys you've actually bought. You're not going to pick the mm-hmm. loanee. Uh, and, and so um, then an agreement was reached with Strasbourg, although they were actually looking for prioritising a winger and a left back. And, and you get the feeling this is where... Blue Co have perhaps sort of strong armed them a little bit. Um, Strasbourg will say, "Oh no, everything it, we discuss together and and we decide what's what between us." But it it does feel like um, Santos was was put, put their way, even though they didn't really need a central midfielder, mm. and he's not started a game for them yet, um, yeah. which, which, which says it all. But um, one significant sort of little thing, little nugget I picked up which Strasbourg may sort of, again, sort of pour cold water on, is that in their search for a winger um, that they were looking at, they, they were looking at some 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 good names, mm-hmm. um, that Blue Co essentially said, we don't want competition for Angelo Gabriel, so don't sign anyone. Um, mm-hmm. So this, and of course, that's worked out great because now Angelo Gabriel's injured. Um, mm. So that's left Strasbourg in a vulnerable position. So this is how the multi-club model, from a Strasbourg point of view, mm. and and this is certainly where the fans are coming from. That they, they they feel you know they could feel um, like they're coming out second best. Yeah, Matt. What are the, I guess, assets we can put it as a blanket term are shared between the clubs in this sort of multi-club ownership? And I can imagine each type of multi-club ownership yeah. varies in what's uh, shared, right? Very much so. So. <clears throat> There are so many, you know, different examples of this, and uh, people are doing it better than others. I think if we just focus on on what I think Chelsea are trying to do, what what, mm. what Bluco are trying to do, it is very much for me a, a, a feeder club model. It, it is, if you like, the, the you know the US sports system that that Bowley knows best. You know, the LA Dodgers have a fantastic farm team system, mm. and the the LA Dodgers are very much at the top of the pile, and. If that is your strategy, it, it can work, right? As for the reason Simon's outlined, you know, they, they looked at France. Why? Because France is really good at football. There's loads of good footballers there. Ligue 1 has a good reputation. It's a young league. Um, it, it has a fantastic sort of uh, reputation for sort of developing talent. It's still one of the big five leagues. Mm. There's there's an opportunity to play in Europe. But, you know, again, probably not at Strasbourg at the moment. Strasbourg were available. French clubs are cheap. They came out of COVID week. Um, French league has been open to the idea of multi-club more open than other leagues there are lots of reasons why um, people look at, at French clubs you know league earn and league league de are, are full of multi-club groups um, so that you know there's that story and I'm, I'm looking at the table and you know the, all the clubs they're up against the, you know they're fighting for relegation mm. against other other multi-club club that have that have English partners so um you know, that's why they're there. So it's about recruitment and it's crucially then about development, right? So, you you know, you, you recruit when you have, you know, uh, a flag in the sand, you have a footprint there in a, in a key football market, but you do use it as a shot window. You use it for minutes, you know, for you use it to develop players you have or to then sell players that are surplus to the group, right? Which helps with FFP and all, all the things that kind of Chelsea and Bowling mm-hmm. and Clearlake are, uh, are thinking about. So there's lots of obvious reasons. So what do you share? Well, you share scouting, you share data analysis. You might share, I know that, uh, Strasbourg have 
have, if you like, beefed up. They've, their their headcount mm. has grown. So that is what Luca would be saying. Look, we we know we'll, we'll get you a good physio. We'll get you a good strength and conditioning coach. We'll get you a good, be, better data analyst. We'll get. Mm. So those are the sort of things that kind of like Strasbourg's previous ownership will be thinking. Okay, look, this was good, right? This was good. But from a Strasbourg fan, all you're seeing is once upon a time we were the most important club in our owner's empire of one. We were the apple of his eye. Mm. So that that sort of an, um, situation that Simon was explaining, where they needed a certain player and maybe they needed a backup, and they didn't they didn't get one because it didn't work with the group strategy. But once upon a time, there was no group strategy. It was Strasbourg strategy. Let's do what's right for Strasbourg. Yes, you may have made us better off the pitch, and yes, there may be more potential, and maybe we'll get a better player every now and then. But, you know, once upon a time, all decisions here were made purely about Strasbourg. They're not made purely about Strasbourg anymore. And I just wonder, and I look at sort of where they've come from and they, they, they look, they, they were going for a good moment in their history. They've mm. been up, they've been down. They went almost bankrupt 20 odd years ago. So they've been, you know, they're, they're not an established league earned club. They've been good for the last few years. I just see, they'd never say this honestly, but I'm, I, I suspect that Blue Co's view of Strasbourg is, it's we're quite happy for you to be a yo-yo club. We want you to be competitive. If you go down, we'd want you to come back up again. Of course we would. And we do mm. want you to play well. We don't want you to be bad. But but you being in league earn is not it's not life or death to us. It's not it's not what we're about. We want you to develop players. We want you to punch above your weight. We would like to sell you a few, you know, sell some players that play for Strasbourg. Yeah, we want you to contribute. But we don't necessarily need you to win. We need Chelsea to win. Mm. No, I want to follow on to that Simon in terms mm. of you know it's a lot of disruption clearly for a club that's still trying to figure itself out in the top flight uh, what do the fans feel about this sort of blue coat takeover the Strasbourg's fans in particular let's just say they're they're more vocal than the Chelsea fans are and, interesting and very very demonstrative from day one really you, you've mm. been it almost feels like a, a game by game basis. You, you you get pictures. We we see obviously the pictures back here in England of, of banners being held up and saying no to Blue Co, etc. Blue Co never welcome here, etc. Um, now the Strasbourg president Mark Heller, he will explain that that the reason he sold or agreed to sell the club, he he's actually the hero of Strasbourg. As, as Matt's mm. already touched on, they they were in financial ruin. They got demoted to the fifth tier of French football, and he led them back to uh, to becoming a, a league owned club. Um, but essentially, he's like, "This is as far as I can take them." Liga went down to eighteen clubs, so the pressure to stay up is 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 more intense. You've got mm. as Matt's touched touched on, sort of rich investors, foreign investors coming in um, across the league. Plus there's the threat of international TV rights only going to those that qualify for Europe. So suddenly it's like, right, if if, if we don't get more money in, we're, we're, we're going to drown. Mm. So, so this from a Strasbourg ownership point of view is why they justify um, joining forces with, with Chelsea and Blue Co. But, Fans don't want this. They, they they don't want to see it to be some kind of project. This sort of um, kids' TV show of of twenty somethings just starting out. Um, they had another indication of this last summer. They they uh, Strasbourg win for Davinson Sanchez. Mm. Um, now that may may many people frown because they'll remember how how much he struggled in the Premier League. Um, at Tottenham, but it made a lot of sense if you actually think again. He's a twenty-seven-year-old defender, perhaps someone who can help the young guys settle in. But Bluco, no players under twenty-five. That that's that's what they're going for, and the supporters are, are now increasingly um, voicing their disgust. And of course it all comes down to results. If, if Strasbourg were winning on a weekly basis, they'd be, mm. they'd be going blue co you're the saviors. Thank you so much. But they're one point above relegation. So of course they're not happy. Well, you could look at another multi-club model that is working, Matt city. 
Girona. I mean, see what's happened there. Fairy tales all 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 round. Um, Fairy tales. <laughs> but there's, there's this, also there's a little of dough as well, right? But there's also twat. I hasten to say yeah, there's yeah. also twat and, uh, and, and Strasbourg also... Strasbourg mm. fans look at twat and say, oh, well, yeah, yeah. Anyway, go from mm. that. Well, no, no. Just look. So you're right. I mean, there there are some some really big groups out there, and 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 the one that I think attracts the most attention because it's the biggest and it's the most high profile is City Football Group. But actually, when you talk to a lot of investors and a lot of people, um, I mean, there's a real industry now around multi-club. There's people that are really evangelical about it. They think it is the sort of the, the way to save European football from itself. They, they see it as a path to sustainability because we haven't also talked about one of the other things that people often often say in its favour is um, you can do things more commercially, right? You've got a bigger, you know, bigger sort of, if you like, canvas, but also economies of scale. Um, you know, you can you can uh, consolidate a lot of your back office, if you like. So, so there's that element to it. Now, like my 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 issue, and it's not really an issue, but my my question about multi club is, it's a great theory, but it's very much an unproven theory. No one is really nailing it yet. I'm I'm going to get to someone who probably is nailing it, or certainly the closest. Now, City Football Group is the one that, as I said, gets a lot of attention because they are big and successful. Man City, and you know, we talked about Girona, but the Montevideo teams won stuff. Uh, New York City is, has won stuff in MLS. Uh, the Japanese team, which I think they're, they're, is, is more of a joint venture. They, 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 they win. They've got wins, right? Mm. But let's not forget they have enormous financial support behind them. Huge. It's a massive bet. On, on this group there's now I think 13 clubs and they've got some partnerships as well but it's not it's a long way from profitable a long way um and um yeah they win some they lose some not every club is as happy as every as, as other clubs um there isn't much evidence of that genuine player trading model working yet there's a few mm. individuals but it's you know it, it's it's not it's not a smash hit by a, by a long shot has an enormous what they what they have is they have an enormous team they have a lot of thought behind it um it, it's definitely working for city for manchester city mm. because they are getting the savings on their back office you know none of the execs at man city are paid by city they're paid by city football group um um you know it's certainly helping manchester city sponsorship deals because you know, they you know they're giving a bigger sort of shot window which which helps sort of push up those prices uh, you know those values of those assets in a legal way I'm not talking about anything, you know, sort of shifty mm. that's happened in the past, may or may not have happened in the past. Um, they are using the the multi-club model to to in its sort of, you know, in its in its sort of best way. But like I said, it's there are still bits that they're not ticking on the multi-club checklist, right? They're they're not. Now, the one that is, the one that when you talk to the multi-club evangelist, like who's doing it really, really well, mm. is Red Bull. Now, it's Red Bull because they have the most coherent strategy. If you think about City Football Group, what is their strategy? Well, it's sort of dominance. It's winning. It's it's being in strategic markets. Yeah, tick that. India, China, US. Yeah, they're on all strategic markets. It's good for UAE. All right. But Red Bull are the ones that from a multi-club model are nailing it. It's because they're, they're, they're what they're trying to do is so simple. They are trying to sell Red Bull. They're trying to sell fizzy drinks. Mm. So it is a marketing play. So the teams are called Red Bull. They wear Red Bull colours. They look like Red Bull. They play Red Bull. They play fast, energetic football, right? They make you think of fast, energetic, caffeinated drinks. They are in Austria. They're in Germany. They're in big mm. markets, Brazil. Yes, they all play the same style and they're coached the same way. It is just coherent. So Red Bull are the most successful multi-club group, I would say by a margin, certainly on a sort of dollar, pound, euro basis. If we go under the Chelsea, um, the Blue Co sort of model, can Manchester United now be classed as a multi-club model, Matt? Um, yes, really speaking, they can, of course, because, um, you know, Ratcliffe, who has 27% on his way to 29%, mm. but has control of the football team, also has control of OGC Nice and Luzanne Sport. Right. So so yes. Now it's it's brand new for, for the you know for the Man United part of that equation. Mm. And we shall see what they do. Do they lean on the other clubs at all? Do the other clubs become feeder clubs? It'd be interesting to see what OGC Nice think fans think about mm. that. I think there are already some concerns there. Um 
so yeah to, to, to be continued i think is is, is how i would yeah. uh, characterize that story but yeah yeah they are yeah okay let's move on to the glorious subject of psr um earlier this month uh, chelsea reported a 90 million loss in the 2022-23 accounts um what does this then mean uh for psr matt where chelsea are concerned oh well look, um I'll be interested to hear what Simon's got to say about this. Look, just for mm. just like for my benefit, just looking at the numbers, looking at other clubs, they uh I think we're right up against it for this current year, 2022, 2023. I think they've obviously just ducked under because they haven't been charged. Uh it must have been close. I think they probably got a very, you know, they probably got a generous COVID allowance. I think they got mm. a generous um allowance for when they were under sanctions. But the the story of Chelsea, there's two two real two mm. real things to say about them. One, they are fantastic at selling players and have been for ten years. Right, so that again was part of the Abramovich uh, model because they they always managed to stay the right side of UEFA's financial fair play rules, and that's because they just sell players really well. They buy a lot of players, they sell a lot of players, and they mm. also have a good academy. You know, they've been accused of hoarding talent in the past. Yeah probably, but they sell a lot of academy talent and they sell academy talent because it in the books for, for mm. FFP purposes, it is pure profit. It, it just, it's this great hit, the positive mm. hit on the, on your FFP calculation. So there's that. And then under uh, Bowling Clear Lake, the other little wrinkle they've added, they've added is they've used this clever amortization policy, which I know we've talked about on the pod mm. before. This is just really how you account for transfers in the books. You spread it out the, the transfer fee over the course of the of the um, of the contract. So you buy a player for fifty million. It's not fifty million pounds that shows up in your accounts the following year. If you give them a five year contract, it's ten million pounds a year for five years. Mm. Give them an eight, eight eight year contract, that that annual cost goes down. So that's what they've done. They've been brilliant at selling players. They've been brilliant at amortizing players. I think they were right up against it. Twenty two two twenty three. I'm looking at twenty three twenty four, the current season, and I cannot see any possible way how right mm. now they are not massively over the threshold it's okay though because they have until june 30th and i think they have to sell players probably academy players yeah 11 people players came in to chelsea 400 million in transfer fees simon are we going to see a summer clear out like none non before again <laughs> <laughs> well, i was going to say you know as matt's already touched upon is Chelsea sell players. This, this isn't new. What, mm. what, what they are sort of potentially hampered by though is everyone knows they need to sell and need to sell. Essentially, they're going to be working towards two transfer deadlines, mm. um, and that inevitably is going to affect what kind of bargaining position you have. Um, but yes, they have players to sell, and and we know quite a few of the names already. I mean, Conor Gallagher, they've. They've essentially been open to selling for three windows now. Mm. Um, and they can certainly demand a fair amount for him. But with one year left on his contract and you, you don't take it to the August deadline, you, it's the June deadline, can you get the £50 million pounds you might expect? Um, it's not going to be a Mason Mount uh, scenario, for example. Mm. But there's Trevor Chalobah. You Don't forget Romelu Lukaku. Um, you've got Lewis Hall that it's been this sort of um, strange scenario at Newcastle, but that that deal's pretty much uh, set in stone, regardless of the fact that he's barely kicked the football for Newcastle. So that money's coming in. Ian Matson, there's a 35 million uh, clause put in his contracts, and he's doing well at, at Dortmund. So Chelsea do have talent to sell, and will undoubtedly get bids for these players because they, they've got good players. My concern is is what happens when the well runs dry, particularly with the academy players, the ones that are pure profit on the books. Um, because eventually, if you keep selling them, you've got none left. Mm -hmm. And then, then you are relying on the players that you've paid over the odds for. And teams are going to go, well, hang on, that guy, he, you paid... £40 million pounds for, just I won't name mm. any names, but you actually I will do. Mark Cucurella, <laughs> £60 million. Pounds. No one's going to go anywhere near that because he, he, he's he been a big disappointment. So so then you're making a loss just as they did with Kula Bali, uh, one of the few older players that Matt referred to, who they, who they signed at the start. Raheem Sterling, another one. 
they basically signed two seasoned guys and neither of them have really worked. Perhaps that's why they went completely the other, the other side because the first two they were stung by. But they're not going to make money back on those guys. And and that will be the concern going long term if, if they maintain this trading philosophy that they have. Yeah, for sure. Um, to finish, Matt, I know mm. the Premier League had a meeting yesterday uh, where PSR once again uh, oh, yes. came up. Uh, can you mm. give us a, a, a quick summary of what that entailed, please? Yeah, well, PSR came up. Uh, this is the sort of shareholders meeting they had yesterday. Uh, it was actually an emergency meeting about the new deal for football, about this uh, much delayed, much talked about financial settlement with the rest of the game, with the rest of the English Football League, that the Premier League have been under pressure to deliver for a couple of years now. And they've been talking about it for a couple of years. Uh, this all came out of, if you like, uh, the pandemic and the crises at Bury and Macclesfield and Bolton and just this idea that English football, the whole pyramid isn't isn't particularly financially sustainable. There's lots of losses at the bottom. Mm. And then, of course, the European Super League debacle. Uh, so there's a fan-led review led by the sports minister, made a white paper. The government is committed to resolving, if you like, a sort of 30-year problem that was being festering, really. This is when the Premier League was created. So just, you know, the broad brushstrokes, once upon a time, about 25% of the game's revenue, if you like, was shared with the rest of the pyramid. It's averaging at about 15, 16% now. The English Football League would like it to be 25% again. They think everyone will be sustainable then and we'll have a nice mm. healthy ecosystem that's good for everybody, right? This is where players and coaches come from. This is this is our part of English football's USP, our, our wonderful narrative, how deep our football goes. New clubs mm. up, new clubs down, the jeopardy of relegation. Um, lots of debate. I think we're probably going to split the difference. will be about 19%. It's a lot more money, but... Mm. Here's the headline. Here's the thing that I think people aren't quite grasping. The Premier League has been unable to decide amongst itself on how to fund this and, and even the sort of terms of this. So this isn't an, an EFL problem at the moment. This is a Premier League problem. And the real story here is the Premier League has never been this divided in 30 years. They are, you know, the whole 14-6, the, 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 the dynamics, the voting dynamics, you need two thirds for a decision and how that was really clever. And it was really clever, you know, checks and balances between the haves and the have nots. I'm sorry, that's out the window at the moment. We are coming through a really weird period. I think COVID shook things up. I think the European Super League shook things up. A lot of US ownership in there, a lot of different personalities around the table. The Premier League has a problem. It is split. And this current issue this new deal for football is just the latest symptom of this split they are all driven by self-interest they are not thinking collegiately they're not thinking corporately this was the part of the premier league success story that unlike some of the other leagues they did think they put their differences aside every now and then and they make really good business decisions i'm not seeing any evidence of that right now and the spin they put out is instead of talking about the new deal instead of deciding the new deal which is what the government which is what the rest of football wants us to do we're going to spend the next few weeks and months sorting out our own new profitability and sustainability rules, you know, which really shouldn't take that long. They're going to basically copy the UEFA rules and tweak them slightly. That's fine. But they had to sort of get some minor win out of yesterday's tobacco, which was a tobacco. Well, perhaps yet again, another symptom of such global stakeholders within the Premier League. But that's another podcast, I'm sure. Gents, thanks so much for your time, Simon, Matt. And don't forget to rate and review the podcast. And we'll definitely be back tomorrow. Thanks for listening.